Today's class is uh, an extension of the history of the atom. The next thing we are going to talk about is how a uh, scientist by the name of Eugene Goldstein discovers a proton using a modified cathode ray tube. And he discovers what we can term uh, canal rays. What he had was a, a cathode with holes built in it. And the residual gas in the discharge to wood, when ionized by the stream of electrons, would be attracted to the anode. So what he, uh, even in the best vacuum uh, that you would have in a cathode ray tube, there's still some residual gas. So if you were to put hydrogen into the uh, cathode ray tube, even uh, though there's a very high vacuum, there's still a few hydrogen atoms floating around. And when the stream of electrons hits the atoms, it can knock off an electron and create an ion. That ion is now positively charged and will be attracted to the cathode, the cathode being negatively charged. So positive particles like the cathode or the cations are attracted to the cathode. So that created a little um, discharge on the cathode side, and they were called anode rays, although they weren't necessarily originating from the anode. He also called them canal rays because they went through the holes drilled in the, in the cathode. Also, Rutherford, as we mentioned earlier, proved that most of the mass in an atom is located in the nucleus with his gold foil experiment. He uh, bombarded uh, gold foil with alpha particles, which is, I said something in the last video that was incorrect. I said that uh, the gold foil should have stopped the alpha particles. In fact, the, the alpha particles should be able to blast right through the very thin gold foil because it's the equivalent of throwing a shot put through a very thin piece of paper. But what uh, Rutherford actually noticed, and the way he detected these, these uh, particles blasting through, was by having a zinc sulfide screen behind the target, the gold, the gold foil target. So most of the particles he expected would blast right through, and most of them did. Some of them, though, looked as though they had been ricocheted like bullets, and, and a few of them even came straight back. So he, he said, uh, as a result of his experiment, uh, experimental observations, that it was the equivalent of having a howitzer shell bounce off a piece of tissue paper. A howitzer shell it was basically a bullet about this big uh, that they, used, they would use in, uh, on a battleship or a, on a, as a field piece. At any rate, uh, there had to be an explanation for why such a heavy bullet, the alpha particle that was being emitted by this radioactive piece of metal, was bouncing off a super thin piece of gold foil. And the, the answer to it was that the, all the mass of the atom is concentrated in a very small nucleus. And they came to the conclusion that although atoms are about 100 to 500 picometers in diameter, the nuclei, the nuclei are only about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 picometers, or 1.2 femtometers in, uh, in diameter. Very small indeed. And all of the mass of the atom, almost all of the mass of the atom is concentrated in that small nucleus. So the analogy I like to use is if the atom was the size of a football field. Excuse the interruption, Mr. Miller, please report to room 216. Mr. Miller, room 216. We're going to continue. Uh, the analogy I like to use is if you made the atom the size of a football field, the nucleus would be the size of a marble in the middle of a football field, and the electrons would be whizzing around in the, in the volume of the football field. But you would be able to enter the football field because the electrons would create some kind of force field as they move at uh, close to the speed of light, just to prevent from falling into the nucleus. Anyway, uh, a question I could ask you here is calculate the density of the hydrogen nucleus, for example, a proton, because the hydrogen nucleus only has one proton, unless, it, unless it's deuterium. Incidentally, the only isotopes that have their own names are isotopes of hydrogen. There are three isotopes of hydrogen. Regular hydrogen, deuterium, which has one neutron, and uh, tritium, which has two neutrons and one proton. They all have one proton. They have, they have anywhere from zero to two neutrons. All the other elements don't have special names for their isotopes. Only hydrogen has that because of the research that was done for the atomic bomb. Presumably. Anyway, let's find out what the density of a proton is. So we're going to use volume is equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed for the volume of the sphere. We're going to assume that the um, diameter of a proton is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, or 1.2 femtometers. And we're going to take half of that, 1.2, so 0 0.6. That's, what I, that's why I wrote 0 0.6 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. Remember, the units of density should be in 
kilograms per meters cubed or uh, grams per uh, centimeter cubed or kilograms per decimeter cubed. That will give you the same number. I chose kilograms per meter cubed and I'm, I'm going to switch it to something else that is more appropriate because of the huge density of the, of the proton. At any rate, here's the mass of a proton in kilograms, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Here's the volume. We're going to cube this radius, and the answer we get is 1.8 times 10 to the 18 kilograms per meters cubed. And just for a little practice in dimensional analysis, I converted kilograms into tons. There's one ton per 1,000 kilograms, so that's 1.8 times 10 to the 15 tons per meter cubed. But let's put it more in perspective and, and change the, the volume measurement to centimeters cubed. So, so there's a million centimeters cubed per meter cubed. Remember, a centimeter is uh, a meter is 100 centimeters. But because we have a volume measure, it's length by width by height. So it's 100 times 100 times 100. That's why it's a million fold difference between a meter cubed and a centimeter cubed. So the density of the nucleus of an atom of a proton is 1.8 times 10 to the 9 tons per centimeter cubed, almost 2 tons per centimeter cubed. So if uh, the nucleus of a hydrogen atom were the size of a pea, roughly, it would weigh 2 billion tons. That should help give you an idea of just how dense matter is. In a neutron star, what you have is all the nuclei of the atoms pushed together so that the nuclei are touching each other. What you have is basically a giant nucleus of neutrons. And that's why the neutron star has such an immense gravitational field. Moving on to the second board, we're going to look at a couple, just the three types of different radiation that we should become familiar with because it's going to be apropos for understanding um, the experiments that were done in the spectroscopy and with radioactive substances. It's not exactly in the book, but I figured it would be the right time to introduce it. Uh, so if, it, if the nucleus of an atom is not stable, it breaks down emitting radiation to shed the energy release that comes from breaking bonds. Anytime you break bonds, it causes the release of energy, or it requires an input of energy. And there are three types of radiation. Uh, there's alpha radiation, beta gear radiation, and gamma radiation. Alpha radiation is a helium nucleus that's been stripped of its electrons. So it's got a positive two charge. Its symbol is uh, the Greek letter alpha. This is a symbol. Um, using atomic symbols. There's two protons in the nucleus. It's got a mass of four because there's two neutrons as well. So two protons and two neutrons gives a total mass of four. And it's got, it's got a plus two charge because it doesn't have any electron. And it's emitted from the uh, nucleus of a radioactive element at something like 20,000 miles per hour. So it's really rocketing, but it has very little penetrating power. You can stop out the radiation with a sheet of paper. Uh, the next level of radiation, although don't get the wrong impression. Alpha radiation is very dangerous. If you have it inside your body, it can give rise to cancer. So anything that's an alpha emitter can be a very dangerous source of radiation if you keep it close to you. Beta radiation is basically just an electron with lots of energy. If you put a lot of energy onto an electron and you make it move really fast, it's called beta radiation. Uh, a thin shield, like maybe a, piece, a thin piece of wood will stop beta radiation. Although it's still uh, dangerous, if you put your hand in front of beta radiation, you're going to get damage, uh, radiation damage to it, just like you would get, you get a burn from it. And finally, gamma radiation is by far the most dangerous radiation. It's a form of light, but it's like really hard x-rays. So x-rays can shine right through your body, and they can take pictures of your bones. Well, gamma rays can shine through a truck, or through metal, and the, you can't stop them except with several feet of concrete. So spectroscopy, uh, sorry, spectroscopy was used to study electronic changes in excited atoms. And uh, we're at this stage in, in, in our discovery of the atom where scientists were using the spectrum of hydrogen to try to understand the internal structure of hydrogen. What they found was that when you heated hydrogen to a high temperature and it, to the point where it started giving off light, you took that light and shone it through a uh, a prism, it would split the light into a spectrum and you would see four lines. And those four lines uh, represented different transitions of electrons. So the electrons of energized atoms occupy more energetic orbitals. And the light energy content of photons is described as C is equal to lambda V. Lambda is the wavelength, and 
B is actually new. The, letter, the Greek letter new is spelled N-U, or pronounced new. And it represents the frequency of the radiation. Lambda is the wavelength in meters, and C is the speed of light. So if you know the wavelength of any light source, you can, you can calculate its frequency by dividing it into the speed of light. And I did an example here. The question is, what is the frequency of ultraviolet light if, it, if its wavelength is 350 nanometers? So I've got the speed of light here in meters per second, and I entered the frequency of the light in meters, not in nanometers, otherwise I get the wrong answer. And the answer is the frequency is 8.5 times 10 to the 14 uh, hertz, or cycles to the minus one. So I wrote it as hertz. Hertz simply means cycles per second. Uh, this understanding of frequency came along with the notion of the photon, where the photon was the smallest unit of light that you could uh, emit whose energy could be calculated. There are two types of spectrum that you should be familiar with. One is emission, and the other one is absorption. They're actually sort of opposite sides of the same coin. An emission spectrum is when you excite atoms in the lamp, and then you pass the light through a prism, and what you get is if you have a pure gas, and you say like hydrogen, you'll get those four characteristic lines, emission lines that hydrogen is, is uh, easily identified by. Likewise, if you were to take a white light, which contains all the colors of the spectrum, and pass it through a prism so that it makes a so that it makes again a, a rainbow, but with all the colors present, and then you pass that rainbow through a sample of a gas of say hydrogen, you would find that there were dark lines appearing in the rainbow that would correspond to the exact position of the emission spectrum of hydrogen. So what's happening is the hydrogen gas is absorbing those select wavelengths. That's how they discovered helium, by the way. They discovered, they discovered the second element on the sun because the sun has some helium in, so has some helium in its atmosphere. It gives off a broad spectrum of light, but the helium gas in the atmosphere captures some of those wavelengths that helium is known to emit when you, when you heat it up. So that's the difference between an emission spectrum and an absorption, uh, absor absorption spectrum. An absorption spectrum constitutes dark lines in a full spectrum, whereas an emission spectrum constitutes bright lines that are the same, in the same spot where the dark lines appear for the absorption spectrum. This, uh, this property of matter is exploited. Here's the interruption. Would all senior football members please meet in the boys' change room? All senior football members in the boys' change room. The absorption spectrum is exploited by modern machines called flame ionization spectrophotometers to identify the presence of different elements in a sample. Say if people wanted to find out if you had arsenic in your blood, they would extract an, a sample of your, of your blood, inject it into the flame ionization spectrophotometer, and if there was any arsenic there, you would get the characteristic, so, uh, the characteristic absorption band that's associated with arsenic, and they would be able to prove that you have arsenic in your blood. So why, is, why does this happen? Why do you get emission spectra and absorption spectra? It's caused by electrons emitting energy and going to a lower orbital in the case of an emission spectrum. So if you're giving off a bright uh, light, it's because one of the electrons has jumped from a higher level to a lower level. On the other hand, an absorption spectrum is caused when an electron goes from a lower level to a higher level. So it takes energy to pump the electron up, and that energy is coming from the light. So it absorbs that energy. That's why you get a dark band. This concept of different atoms and molecules giving off different frequencies of light or absorbing the same was the foundation of atomic physics. How did scientists know anything about the atom? How were they able to figure out anything? By looking at the spectra that they emitted. You can't put an atom under a microscope because you can't see it. It's too small. So you have to look at what it does to its surroundings in order to deduce anything about it. And then the last thing I'd like to throw in there is that modern machines exploit infrared and ultraviolet emissions to identify chemical substances. So when you get to university, you're going to hear about IR, which stands for infrared. You're going to hear about NMR, which stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. You're going to hear about FTIR, which is Fourier, transfer, uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And you'll hear about uh, GCMS, gas chromatograph uh, mass spectrometer. All these machines are now used very high-tech, and they're used for identifying 
unknown substances or samples of, of, uh, of chemicals or for determining what the concentration of certain chemicals are in, uh, in solutions of, of unknown origin. Stop.